question. Really? No, I have a hard time staying away from writing the book, which my husband could certainly tell you. And um, after, I, when he came back from that trip and said, well, how did Peter the Great go? I said, well, I found out a whole lot of really interesting information. It's going to take longer, I think. It actually ended up taking 18 months to write it, and it was a complete spin-off. And every so often, he'd say, but Terry, aren't you writing a book about Kalamazoo? And I'd say, well, I am, honey, but this is so interesting. I'm just going to kind of go with this for now. And I've had, I had a lot of fun writing it, doing it with the subheadings, as you mentioned. So before we actually look at some of the photographs um, from the book and one or two others that aren't in the book but you've supplied, let's briefly tell the viewers about Peter. Peter was born here in Kalamazoo. Yes. He was born on a farm. He was born on a 600-acre horse farm in Kalamazoo in 1895, and the... Um, the mansion is the Oaklands. Most Kalamazooans would probably be familiar with the Oaklands as the president's home for Western Michigan University. What, the original president's home. Yes, it's not anymore. No. Um, it's the beautiful mansion that was built in 1869 <coughs> across Michigan Avenue from uh, the Bernhardt Center on Western's campus right so now. So we're talking about going up, because I always think that Michigan Avenue is downtown. I have trouble but with that, that too. The piece that goes up off um, Stadium Drive is Michigan Avenue. So into the center of the kind of western part of Absolute center. WMU campus. Yes. Bernhardt Center on the right. Right opposite is the Oaklands. Yes. Beautiful home. Beautiful home. Set back. And that was once on a big farm, a 600-acre farm? A 600-acre farm. Yes, it, um, from 1873 to 1875, it had been built by Robert S. Babcock. And... Um, he sold that to Benjamin Austin, and from 1873 to 1875, it was a dairy farm, and it later became a horse farm, a 600-acre horse farm. And um, in 1895, when Peter the Great, um, when he was foaled, it was a horse farm, and the owner, Daniel D. Streeter, um, had um, developed quite a horse farm. He was trying to breed for, you know, um, to have really wonderful racehorses, and he certainly succeeded with Peter, although Peter wasn't supposed to be a particularly good horse. Do you want me to explain yes, that? Yes, okay. yes, um, Well, as in with dogs, pedigrees are important, and horses have pedigrees too. And um, Peter the Great's sire, his name was Pilot Medium, he came from wonderful lineage. Um, the sire himself, Pilot Medium, actually was crippled at the age of between one and two, and so he never raced. So it was never determined whether or not he would be a fast horse mm -hmm. or not. But because of his lineage, he came from harness horse people would know um, that Hambletonian 10 was uh, probably the founder of basically all of the harness race horses today. 99% of them at least are from Hambletonian 10. And Peter comes from Hambletonian 10 on both sides of his family tree. His dam's um, lineage, however, was not as perfect. He, she, she had a great-grandmother, I think it was, that was unknown, and people would always say unknown. And so he wasn't as expected to be particularly good, but he certainly surprised them, as we'll get to um, in the end. Are we keeping those little tidbits for the no, end? Well, no. I, my job is to take an expert like you and say, Hold on, remember I'm not an expert. And, and maybe slow down a little. Peter the Great, born up on what is now the campus of Western Michigan University, you said didn't have a great lineage. He wasn't expected to be anything great. No. Then you said his sire, that's his father, mm -hmm. uh, hadn't raced. He was injured before he raced, so he had no list of gold medals to prove that he was a fast horse. Correct. His mother, you said the dam. Yes. His mother had no pedigree as far as we could see, so... She had a good pedigree, but oh. she had the one un unknown spot. But in lineage, that was important, and people would talk about Peter the Great and say, well, you know, he has the yeah. unknown factor. So he was a surprise horse. He was very much of a surprise horse. A dark horse. horse. Yes. Well, was he dark or, or light? Was, was he was he actually called um, a rich blood bay, um, a red, a reddish brown horse. The the word bay is difficult to define, and in fact, 
you mentioned sire endowment. I explain all those terms in the book. Anything okay. that I, I knew those, those were fairly simple, but anything that I didn't understand, I explained because I figured that people who would be reading the book would be, would not know either. Not having any idea that it would sell um, copies on eBay internationally to, um, to places like, um, let me think, um, Sweden, the first book sold to Austria, Sweden, Finland, um, Denmark. Um, the only one of those that it hasn't sold to is Norway, but I'm hoping. Um, Belgium, the UK, Germany, France, um, someone from Italy inquired but didn't buy, um, Australia. Um, and so the book has sold very well because Peter's progeny, that was one of the words I looked up, his, um, not just his children his and grandchildren, but all the way along, his progeny, um, so are still generations? winning races. Um, the one that, do we want to jump ahead to the one that just won or put that in uh, later on? Just, just uh, roughly how many? Uh, between eight and maybe 12 or 13, depending on how young the horse how, was how when it had. When 12, it had 13 generations. And he has, with the help of other horses along the way, been the great, 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 great grandfather of a whole string of outstanding horses. And Absolutely. you used another phrase. You said harness horses. Yes. We're not talking about, I think in the book you talk about a thoroughbred. A thoroughbred is a racehorse as we think of them. Yes? The jockey on his back, you know, starting yes. out from a that's, start. that's a thoroughbred. Yes. We don't re re refer to horses like Peter the Great as a thoroughbred. None at all. We call them... Standard bred. Standard bred yes. horses. Sounds a hard word for something that's outstanding as Peter the Great to be a standard bred horse. Well, and it sounds, um, it's actually not as difficult to define as it sounds. Um, I'll hold up the book, mm, although please. I don't know if you'll be able to focus in on this well enough. But there we have um, a picture of Peter the Great as a harness horse. He has a cart on the, um, on the side there, and you can barely see his driver. And we'll get to that and explain who he is later. But harness horses do pull a sulky, a cart, and the trainer rides in the seat and uses a whip not to to, do th to hurt the horse, but to um, kind of flick it on the metal poles that are there. And um, so it isn't applied to the horse. Oh, so that, that following your our conversation, I went to the racetrack. I had never seen a horse race of any description oh, until right. I spoke to you and you said there will be racing at the county fair and the Kalamazoo fairgrounds mm -hmm. and Wednesday was seniors day I got in free very nice and took took a video camera which kind of functioned and a slide camera um, so I think I read your book before I went so I understood some of it but I thought that long stick was to hit the horse it isn't it's to clip make a noise. And I was watching carefully to see if that was true. And it does look like they're hitting the horse mm. because they're, um, the poles that hold the horse and the, and the sulky yes. together, yes. And when I looked every time it was, they were tapping it on the poles. Okay. I don't know if poles is the right word, but. I think it's time we looked at some of the photographs you sent. Okay. If we can talk to uh, Bill and Anthony out there in the control room, if we could have the first um, a group of slides. There's one slide which we'll leave behind, uh, the 14th slide. Let's, um, and by the way, I, I chose these not at random, but I put them in the sequence I thought would work. Uh, on the screen there, Terry, you can see Peter the Great, 207 and a quarter, I think it says. That. Yes, and that is the, whenever a horse, uh, has um, set a racing time and it's put next to his name once he's older and retired. The time, 207 and a quarter, is Peter the Great's best, lifetime best time. And so that al always identifies the horses. That's two minutes, seven and a quarter seconds. Seconds. In for what, for a two mile? A one mile track. A one mile race. A one mile track. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the standard bred part is that if a horse in the 1870s, 79 I think, could run a mile in two minutes, 30 seconds, 
or less and meet that standard, then he got to be in an important standard uh -huh. bread book. Standard doesn't mean standard bread. Ho ho, regular. It means it met a certain a certain cachet, you know, yes, yes, yes a certain you. status. So Peter the Great, that is a monument. We've got one or two others later, but that is up on Western's campus, I believe. It is. It's um, is it close, close to the Western Michigan University Administration Building, across the street from the Bernhard Center, and pretty much next to and a little farther over um, from the Oaklands. But it's there, and you can find it pretty easily. And so I explain in my book okay. where you can find it. If they it. go to look at the Oaklands, mm -hmm. which is easy to find, not too far away, they can find this actual uh, monument. As we look at it, off to the right would be the administration building, and off to the left and set back under the oak trees for which it was named, you would find across an expanse of lawn the Oakland's Oakland. beautiful mansion. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the next one, please, Bill. This, I think, is something that no one alive here has seen. Uh, it was torn down in 1944 oh, when well Western bought the property. Yes. So this um, is the barn in which Peter was born. In which Peter was born. The, it's said that he was foaled in the northwest corner of the barn. And um, the barn actually was two stories, and it does look like it. Um, it had an elevator and it had running water about seven years before the house had running water. <laughs> wonder what Mrs. Streeter thought about <laughs> that. Um, Horses were more important than humans? Apparently. Okay. And um, it was said that you can see the inset there, birthplace of Peter the Great, raised visitors welcome. And um, it was said in the Gazette that as far as, um, as long as four decades later, that people would still come went during Grand Circuit time, because Kalamazoo had Grand Circuit races at Recreation Park, mm -hmm. uh, that they would come out and stand there in awe, even four year, 40 years later, and that they thought as many as 20,000 visitors were coming to see Peter the Great's barn and his monument. People made a pilgrimage to the stable. Yes. Um, thank you. Now that I believe where the barn stood is the garage for the Oaklands, am I right? Yes, but it, what's said, oh, and I'm not exactly sure. Yes, yeah, okay. so that's what's said. I'm not sure if it's extremely accurate, but that is the way it's explained. But they, they put, put up a notice saying, hey, if you're a race attendee, feel free to come in and have a look around. Yes. Thank you. Next one, please, Bill. Aha, now this is Mr. Streeter, I believe. Yes, Daniel D. Streeter. He was 52 years old when Peter the Great was foaled in 1895. And um, he was a railroad man, wealthy railroad man, as you would guess from the mansion. He used to go to Chicago two or three times a week to work, commuted all the way to Chicago, and he would take the trains, which actually, when you think about it, passed right below, behind and below on Stadium Drive. It was called Territorial Road at the time. And he would take the train to Chicago. He to probably work. just put up his hand and it stopped for him. <laughs> I don't know how that would work. He was a railroad magnate. He made he his money on the railroads. Yes. And was a horse breeder as a kind of a hobby at first. Yes, he loved his horses. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Next one, please, Bill. Now, I think I put down here that this is Peter winning. Am I right? This is Peter the Great winning. A, the Transylvania race in October of, I think it was, um, of 1899, I'm sure it was. He only raced in seven races. He, um, we don't have any pictures of him winning a race while he was living in Kalamazoo. He had a really hard time learning how to trot. Would this okay. be? When the, um, okay. when the slides are over and they can see us again, we'll show that. I'm going to ask you to explain the difference between a trotting horse and a Pacing, pacing horse. Pacing okay. horse. But he was a trotter. Trotter. Mm -hmm. And it is a complicated gait, I think. It is, which uh, you'll be able to see when we okay. get into that and point. And Peter, despite being a brilliant horse and a winning horse, had difficulty learning, <laughs> learning uh, the steps. Yes, he did. And okay. um, we'll explain that while we're showing it. This is actually, he raced in seven races. And he... Um, in this one, he won the heat. He actually won two heats, but he did not win the race. And heats were, um, for the people who are familiar with track, they're heats, and then you eliminate some of the people, and the ones that are left are the ones that had the best times. Mm -hmm. That's a very vague, but decent They do some averaging. They, they do yes. some adding up, a cumulative 
kind of time to yeah, find the just overall winner. In, um, if, you, if you won the most heats, mm -hmm. then you were able to progress on to the next heat. But it changed, so that isn't a cut and dry okay. rule. And um, you can see a little bit the scoreboard there, the tall thing to the left of mm -hmm. the, um, the grandstand where the judges are. And probably the viewers won't be able to see that it's numbered, but you can get the idea. So if you won the first race, the odds were that you would be given the best spot on the track in the next race. Not always happened, but often. And so the best spot on the track is the inside part. If you picture an oval, and the inside of the oval mm -hmm. is smaller than That's the outside. Shorter. 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 Mm -hmm. so, so if we talk about a two-mile track, is it two miles measured around the inside of the track or the middle of the track or the outside of the track? I don't know, Keith. Fine. I, don't, I know. don't either, so that's two of us. But the, it, an interesting fact is that harness racing doesn't start like thoroughbred racing. Now, Peter's forebears were thoroughbreds. They came, um, the first ones, really important ones, came from Arabia, and we know okay. how he traced there. But um, as far as the races are concerned, they actually start about a third of a mile before the starting line. And it took me a bit to grasp that concept. So they, um, they line up about a third of a mile behind the starting line. And nowadays we have the... A, um, truck, a truck goes ahead and yeah. then the truck pulls off to the side and they go past the starting post at a gallop. And that's when the race begins. Okay, and yes. when they finish, they go past that... Starting post again to end. Sta and there's mm -hmm. a photo finish sometimes. They're all in a bunch. So yes. they've got all that equipment yes. that you get in the thoroughbred racing. They've uh, got it yes. on the track. Photo finishes. Photo finishes. What mm -hmm. have you. But they start in a whole bunch. This is... Um, now this is a track that is still in existence, isn't it? This is the... One down at the fairgrounds? It is right? the one at the fairgrounds on Lake Street. It was uh, built in 1903. A group of businessmen got together and built the uh, racetrack. It's called, it was called Recreation Park at the time. Now we call it the Kalamazoo Fairgrounds. And it has a, a fascinating and interesting history, which I know we don't have time to go into. Um, the grandstand is over 100 years old, obviously, 104. And there are still harness races there during fair time. And my husband and I went the same day as you oh. and quite enjoyed the harness races there. And um, it was um, very interesting. And we had the Grand Circuit here in Kalamazoo from 1908 until 1931 when the Depression pretty much knocked. It started getting uh, difficult to get people to turn out. They didn't have the money for horse races. No. Yeah. And so um, for that period of time, we had harness racing here and we were on the Grand Circuit, which would be like, Major League Baseball, and then you have Minor League. Mm -hmm. um, so we were on the Major League. Kalamazoo. This is the Grand Circuit, Grand Circuit race, race back mm -hmm. in 1909 or Nine. something like that? 1909. And mm -hmm. the third, am I right, was that the third racetrack Kalamazoo had? That was the third racetrack. Do we have time to go into sure, it? Sure, let's do it. Okay, bit I jotted down because that was interesting. I mean, in the very early days of Kalamazoo, there was a racetrack. Yes, um, Titus Bronson was the first permanent white settler in not Kalamazoo County, because there was someone else, but in Kalamazoo, what we would call downtown, what became downtown. And um, he settled in 1829. By 1837, there was a jockey club, and they constructed the first track in 30, 1837. Um, and from then, for 20 years until 1858, uh, the track was called the Burr Oak, or the Axtell Track. Mm -hmm. And if you were coming, going down um, Westnage, going south, um, heading towards Howard Street. Mm -hmm. um, you would, if you watch, you'll see Baroque Street and Axtell Street, and the track was set um, in the southwest section of the village, um, west of Westnage and south of Vine, and that lasted for 20 years. And the second track um, went from 1858 to 1886, a bit over 20 years, and it was called the National Driving Park. It was in the Hayes Park section of Washington Square, and um, more or less between Palmer and Hayes Park. Um, what we would think, uh, we would see it off to the right if you're heading to downtown from, say, the airport, okay. that area. The third and last track was the one that we've just discussed. And um, uh, now we've changed slides. Okay. So it's the mysteries of, uh, of television. This is Gunner. This is Gunner. Who he is Gunner? Gunner is Peter the Great's six times great grandson. 
and he belongs to a man named Dave Bronson and his wife Donna. Dave actually ordered my book because he had heard one of, about one of my presentations. I've done 16 book signings and um, maybe about a quarter of that presentations, maybe half. Um, and he had heard about it and um, mentioned in his request on eBay that he had a retired pacer who was 14 years old, actually, excuse me, trotter, retired trotter, and named Gunner that was related to, and he mentioned one of the names of Peter's progeny. So when I sent him the book and inscribed it, I was excited to inscribe it to him as the owner mm. of a Peter. And um, this is Gunner, and he looks quite a good deal, I think, like Peter the Great. And um, so he's, he lives in the Kalamazoo area, so both he's Gunner a local, and his owner. A local horse. He's a local horse. He retired. Um, he's a retired trotter. So mm -hmm. there is uh, evidence of what we're talking about in the book. Peter mm -hmm. started a whole line of excellent horses. Excellent. You said a huge p proportion of the trotting horses, harness horses, today, uh, the winners are descended from Peter the Great? A huge portion. I have um, just learned one of the men who bought my book was uh, the editor of Harness Racing International out of Australia. And um, when he acknowledged that he had gotten my book safely, he said, I attached a little something interesting here. And, um, and he said, um, it turned out to be a 118-page, double-sided pages compilation of Peter the Great's progeny, and I thought, it, I thought at first that it was all of Peter's progeny, but it wasn't. It's just his um, offspring. Just a start. Who so have um, we, we know what we're talking about here. What, what you're saying here is write an interesting book and get to know interesting people all over the world. True. Who will write to you. True. Who is this? This is, um, you say, a caretaker. This is Jake Councilman, Peter the Great's caretaker. Uh, he went through some difficult times, and I know we don't have time to talk about that. He had four owners, and he, um, this was when he was um, purchased in 1916 for $50,000. That would be over $900,000 in today's yes. market. And um, the last six years of his life, he lived um, at Laurel Hall Farm in Indianapolis. And this was his caretaker and probably his, his first good friend. He had some hard times, which I explain in the book. Okay. Next one. This is Laurel Hall Farm again, and um, it just shows the opulence. The man who bought him was named Stoughton Fletcher the third. He was a fabulously wealthy Indianapolis banker, who um, third generation banker whose family had just um, amazingly wealthy. I think that in 1921 his banks were worth 44 million dollars. Remember that was he 1921. Was Next one, please. Yes. This is a picture of a 1923 uh, magazine that was sent to me by the editor in Australia. And it was uh, published three days after Peter the Great's death, and in 1923 in March. And it says, which I don't think we can see. Le roi est mort. Yes. The king is the dead. The king is dead in French. And um, so, yes, uh, Peter the Great was known around the world um, Maybe not around the world so much in those days, but in the days since, absolutely. But the um, mares were sent from around the country, across the nation, the creme de la creme of the nation were sent to Peter the Great to breed mm. with him. So his death was mourned in the leading journal of harness racing. Oh, absolutely. The, um, the editor of in Australia said that Peter the Great is one of the top five trotting sires of all time and that um, the compilation that I mentioned was just the races that were important national yeah. or 2% uh, of races. This is one side of one of the monuments. It is. It's the, um, the reverse side of Peter's monument. Um, it's the erased etching of Peter the Great, obviously chosen. We don't know who actually commissioned the monument, nor do we know where it was first, but it is now um, on the grounds of the West Baden Dome Hotel, and that near is French Lake. That's the front of it in the garden setting. And this photograph was actually taken um, by my dear friend, Kathy McConnell. And um, she actually um, traveled down to Indianapolis and then uh, to actually to French Lake and got this picture. It's and a beautiful- another one, please, Bill. 